If you have a Bible, open it up to Revelation chapter 19 this morning. And this morning, we're going to talk about one of our fundamental truths. You know, this is an Assemblies of God church, and if you've been around a while, you know that there are, are some foundational teachings that we adhere to, and that's a voluntary cooperation. We looked at their doctrine, I guess, years and years and years ago, and we said we will, we will uh, agree with that because it's solid in the Bible. And this is just, it doesn't mean that other denominations don't believe these things. They're in the Bible. They're widespread beliefs. Um, but they are noted as Assemblies of God core, core doctrines and fundamental truths. And this morning, we're going to talk about one of those that comes near the end of time. It's called the Millennial Reign of Christ. And we're going to read some scripture here in just a minute, and I'm going to open up with a word of prayer first. So, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity today to open up the word today and uh, just to freely study and learn and worship you here at this street corner. And uh, we just ask for your blessing on our time together that you would speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And before I read in Revelation 19, I'm just going to give you a little setup because that's, there's a, a lot of verses there we're going to read in just a minute. But I wanted to let you know what we're even talking about, you know. Um, when, you, when you go to um, read the Bible, you see a story that describes from the beginning to the end of basically human existence on the earth. And obviously, uh, the first book of the Bible kind of begins that in Genesis. And then you see this journey of humanity for several thousand years, and you end up in you know, the Hollywood book, which they make all the movies about, you know, the, the end times, the last days, the, the calamities that will come upon the earth. And most of those are found in the book of Revelation, and that gets a lot of publicity. But interestingly enough, what doesn't get a lot of publicity is what comes after all of that tribulation. And this is one of our fundamental truths is called the millennial reign or the 1,000 year reign of Jesus on the earth. And it's like, sometimes I think Christians might think I'm crazy when I say that. And I think it's because they haven't read the Bible all the way. Because I'm not making anything up. We're going to see it here in just a moment. Jesus himself, uh, he speaks about this time of tribulation immediately before what we're going to discuss this morning. In Matthew 24, he says there's going to be great tribulation, and this is how he describes it. Such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor uh, shall it ever be. And unless those days were shortened, this is what Jesus says, no flesh would be saved. So we've seen some things, we've heard about some things, and we've read about some things that are pretty incredible. Like the flood, Noah's flood, where God destroyed almost all of everything. And Jesus says, this time is worse than that. If I didn't cut it short, nobody would make it. Nobody on a boat would make it if I didn't cut these days short. Um, we've seen natural disasters. We've seen wars. We've seen all kinds of things. But we've never seen anything like what's coming. Now, that's what you see all the movies about. That's what all the Christians are online and, and, and watching YouTube videos all the time about. It's this, this flashy stuff, and it, it is exciting, but you know, the way we believe and the way I believe the Bible represents it is that the believers won't be here for that moment anyway, and it really doesn't make sense why we would. You're like, thank you, Lord, for saving me, and he's like, you're welcome, bam, you know, Here's a bunch of death and destruction like you've never seen before. Oh, thank you, God. Uh, it's great to be one of your people. That's not really, uh, doesn't really match up with his plan in the Bible. I know there's some believers that want to be punished. I don't know why. Um, but it doesn't seem to be there in the scriptures. But what is there in the scriptures is some promises from Jesus. And it is an experience with him here that isn't death and destruction and doom and gloom and tragedy and widespread, you know, everything. And that's, that's uh, what we're going to talk about today. And so that's kind of the setup. So we go from the most extreme time on the earth that has ever happened 
into what we're going to talk about today, which is a physical Jesus Christ ruling on the earth. And in Revelation 19, we'll read a few verses, starting in verse 11, if you're there. And he says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it, on him, was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. We're talking about Jesus here. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, this passage takes us to the end of that crazy time I was speaking of. So Jesus is the one that puts an end to that, and he does it by showing up. In verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun. We're just continuing on. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. He's describing, we're going to skip a few verses. He's describing the defeating of all these armies. Why don't you go down to verse 20. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. We're talking about the end of the Antichrist and his right-hand man, okay? This is the culmination of these events. I can't go into too much detail this morning. We'd never get out of here. But let's save this for a different series. But I'm going to continue on here. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire. And in verse 21, the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Talk about a battle of battles. And then Jesus comes in and ends the battle. You see this great finishing to the worst person who's ever been on the earth. And, you know, of course, he's got Satan in him, the Antichrist. And he is doing the worst things that have ever happened on the earth. And Jesus himself comes and puts an end to that. He comes and, and, and brings something to the earth that the earth has not seen. You know, we've seen a lot of violence, and we're going to see here what Jesus does. He brings something the earth has not seen, and what he brings is a kingdom of peace. Now, if you, if you want to follow, follow me over here, you can. I also have a few scriptures on the screen, and you can go Ezekiel 37. Uh, I'm going to read you a little, couple little passages here. He's uh, talking about bringing Israel back into their their homeland, I guess, and when you follow kind of that, that uh, historical narrative there, you see that God's chosen people, he chose some people out of a land, and he made them into a nation, and that's what is today the nation of Israel, and there's some promises there for them, and there's some uh, physical boundaries, and throughout their history, they have been persecuted and removed from their homes, and then, you know, it's like this cycle of of will we ever get to go home and just be here and be safe? It's nice to live in America. We don't have to think about that. We haven't had to think about that um, in my lifetime or anybody that I've ever known. We've always been able to stay here in our land and not have to leave and come back or, or uh, have war on our land or anything else. But that's not the way it's been for Israel. And Man, the Antichrist kind of puts a whammy on their hopes during his time on the earth. And this is what Jesus says. Um, where are we at here? He says, Behold, verse 21, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen where they've gone and gather them on every side and bring them to their own land. I will make them one nations upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. And then let's go down to verse 23. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, or with their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. So they shall be my people, and I will be their God. 
And you go down to verse 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. And I like verse 27. He says, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And I'm I'm saying, wow, God, like you really turn this thing around when it's time. When you, when you know God, you can see his character when you read about him in a lot of different ways. You know, if, you, if God's ever done anything for you or in you, 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 you know that much about him. And nobody can take that away. And when you see him working in other areas, it's like you can identify with that. When I read about Jesus coming back and bringing peace to the earth, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of my own life. It reminds me of so many times when I get in my car and I go somewhere or I go to the store or I go to the ballpark or I go somewhere and I'm around a bunch of people and it's chaos and it's violence and it's evil and it's just like stressful and you know, you hear the way people treat one another, how they talk, you see the attitudes, you see what's going on. And then I'm reminded that I don't have to live that way. I'm reminded that the only reason that I don't live that way is because Jesus came into my life and he brought me an everlasting peace. I mean, it's kind of neat how he does it to us spiritually and there's going to come a day when he'll do it physically for everybody. And that's what we're kind of reading about today. But I mean, you got to kind of think of it both ways here. Because I I think a lot of Christians forget that Jesus himself is coming back. I might say this a lot in in church, and that's because I believe it, and because I believe it's important for us to know it. Our faith is not an idea. It's not a theory. It's not a philosophy. It's not something that we choose to agree with. It's really not that. If you're really a believer, you're looking for the person of Jesus Christ to return. And if you're not looking for him, you're going to be in trouble. You're really going to be in trouble because when he comes back, you're not going to be on the right side of things. You can't be a believer and not understand that Jesus himself exists and that he is returning. I mean, that's, that's essential to his message. He cannot just save us philosophically. He can't just save us like, oh, I think this way now. So therefore, my sins are forgiven and everything's good. Uh, He's going to save us from our sin now through faith, but he's also going to physically save us in in a certain way. And we'll, we will literally be with a, an actual God in heaven. Like, we're not just going to be floating around in some idea somewhere. God, when you read about the end times, it says God has prepared a place for us. And that place is where he is, and we will also be with him. We won't just be somewhere in the air, in somebody's thoughts, I mean, let's not get too weird about things, right? Our faith is, is tangible. We don't just believe in just some crazy idea. We're talking about Jesus Christ himself. And the word of God, when you read it, that's the entire central theme of the book. If you take the person of Jesus out of the Bible, we have nothing. We have absolutely nothing. I mean nothing. Nothing. We won't have any good thing. You say, well, well, I follow the Ten Commandments. If you take Jesus out of the Bible, you'll never see those. They would never exist. There would never be a purpose for them. There wouldn't be a purpose for the entire Old Testament without Jesus. All of the prophets say there is a Messiah coming, and this is what he will do, and this is who he is. So I want to remind us today that we are headed for a personal encounter and a lifetime, an interaction in life 
with Jesus Christ himself. You know, the scriptures that we read, they were talking about him. They weren't talking about, you know, just some idea. We're talking about Jesus on that white horse and all the descriptions that we read. So he makes, <clears throat> excuse me, a covenant of peace with his people, and it's an everlasting covenant. And real peace is really one of those God qualities. You know, Jesus himself is called the Prince of Peace in the Bible. Uh, Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There's a government coming, and the millennial reign of Christ is the phrase that we use that millennial is a thousand years, and of course we know what it means to reign and to rule. It's a 1,000 year government with Jesus at the top. And I know that might sound like a crazy thing. I think that they don't probably teach this in Sunday school. Maybe the kids, I don't ever remember learning about this until I read the Bible as a young adult myself, maybe a teenager. I started uh, reading through the Bible and I came across some really neat things. And I'm like, oh, they didn't make a cartoon about that one. You know, I never watched that. Noah's Ark is easy, you know, but Antichrist, false prophet, destruction of armies, that's going to be tough to put in a cartoon, G-rated, right? But the peace of God, it really doesn't have anything to do with what we think peace is. You know, the, the, one of the primary driving forces of all of governments today is trying to establish peace on the earth. You ever notice that? Let's make a treaty. Let's make a deal. Let's compromise. Let's try to do this to preserve peace. Let's sign this nuclear deal to preserve peace so we don't blow everybody up. Let's do this. Let's go beat up these bad guys over here because, sorry guys, you're pretty good, but uh, because we got to preserve peace, you know, and, we're, and sometimes we do a decent job and sometimes we do get rid of some bad guys, but we never quite find the peace, do we? We never quite obtain it. Well, you know, when you look at, at it's interestingly enough, in the Middle East, and you look at what the Bible refers to as that land, uh, which is today known as Israel, and how much strife is over those boundaries. And everybody has a solution, but nobody will be happy with it. Nobody will. Well, uh, and, and it's funny, Pastor always reads the, the quote about peace, uh, the wonderful moment in time where everyone sits around reloading. That's, that's, that's our version, right, as people. That's our version of peace. But the peace that Jesus brings is found when people submit to God. The peace in the reign of Christ, in the millennial reign, when he establishes his government, it will work because he's God and the world is submitting to God. That's why peace is going to work. The reason why peace works in me on a daily basis is, is because I'm submitting to God. When I don't submit to God, because guess what, newsflash, I'm not perfect in my own strength. And I've got bad days and I miss it sometimes. And when I miss it, that is one of the first things that I notice, is that something isn't right. And it's not just some like, ooh, like something isn't right, I don't know what it could be. It's like, I haven't been listening to God. I've been doing my own thing. I forgot about him. I've been walking in a bad attitude, whatever it might be, and it can just escalate, right? The peace that Jesus brings into my life is found when I submit my life to God. The reason why we have altars up here, and by the way, if you're new, we do our preaching up front, and then we have like a little break, and then we have a worship service. And during that worship time, a lot of people will come up and pray and worship up here at the altar, not to be seen by anybody that's not. It's a, a point of submission. It's to just kneel and say, God, I'm just going to worship you here today, and I, I'm going to submit my life to you and then declare that to you today. That's what that's all about. This is what brings peace into our hearts today, and this is what will be, bring a physical peace to the earth, and it's a promise from God. Interestingly, when we read about God's promise of judgment and wrath, uh, we like to cast those things aside as well. It would be nice just to talk about peace and just say everything's great all the time if you serve God and nothing 
nothing bad could ever happen to anyone. Everybody's going to make it, and God is so merciful that he doesn't care what you do, and everybody's just going to make it. Well, that's not what his word says. We can't just cast off some things. We can't, we can't forget about the entire Bible. The truth is that God's wrath will come, but it won't come on the believers. It won't come on his children. He's preparing us for an inheritance. The wrath isn't supposed to be poured out on us, and he wouldn't like it to be poured out on anybody. But his wrath will come, and when we reject him, we put ourselves in the way of his wrath, and it's going to come because he said it will. And it comes, and it should be a wake-up call to all of us before it comes to know who Jesus is and make sure we know that. Make sure we know we're not following some idea. Make sure we know who Jesus is. He's the one that's returning to rule. We don't want to be under his wrath. Remember when we read that scripture, the sword comes out of his mouth, and it just cuts down all of the armies of the devil. Well, those armies are people. Those armies are people who have rejected God, who have decided they they don't want the peace of God. They want what the devil is offering They want to follow the Antichrist. And, you know, sometimes you make that decision, and the Bible says that there's a great deception. It's a spiritual thing. You know, the the devil has some spiritual power, just not more than God. But he is allowed to deceive nations, and it's mentioned many times in those passages that we read. And when he does, then they, they do the things that he wants to do. And that puts them in a path of God's wrath. And that's, that's not what we want. We want to be in the path of submission to Jesus. We need to make sure we know who he is. We need to make sure that we know the salvation he has offered us. So, once again, when I think about salvation, if we're talking about the end of the world, I think about, God, save me so I don't get obliterated, right? Save me before the 100-pound hailstones and the intense heat that, that men are cursing God over, and they're biting, they're gnawing their own tongues, the Bible says, in agony. Save me from the darkness when the sun is blotted out for extended amounts of time. Save me from the time when all the green grass is destroyed and the trees are destroyed on the earth because of things that we don't even know what causes it. Is it man-made? Is it natural? We don't know, but the Bible speaks of great destruction in the end times. Yeah, we need to know that there's a salvation available for the end times, but we need to know there's a salvation available for us now. You know, that peace of God that I'm able to walk in, not able to, but like I, I know how to do it by my own power, but that I'm allowed to walk in, that comes because the Lord has saved me and he has regenerated me. You know, we talk a lot in this church about being born again. Jesus in John 3, he says, unless you're born again, You cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so there's something that happens now as well. We don't want to just be saved like, Lord, make sure I don't die and go to hell. Make sure I don't die when the Antichrist comes. Make sure I don't get deceived and take the mark. You know, the beast is the Antichrist. So the mark of the beast is a mark that bears his name. And that's what people will be marked with in the time preceding Jesus' reign on the earth. And that's part of that great deception, right? So it's not just, Lord, help me to not take the mark of the beast. You know, that shade of, of uh, gray won't look good on my forehead or my right hand. I don't want to look bad. No, but there's a salvation now that should be taking place. There's a saving from my sin that's destroying me. And I'm watching it decay my body every day that I'm alive. And I'm watching it destroy the, the world around me and everybody else, and nobody escapes death. Lord, how can we escape this? And he offers a salvation now. And so the beautiful thing is, when you're born again and the Spirit of God dwells in you, you have a guarantee of your faith, and it's a guarantee of your inheritance. It's the promise, the Bible says, the promise that he has promised us is an eternal life. So when the wrath of God comes, it comes on the disobedient, those that have rejected God. It comes on the devil and all of his people that have rejected God. And God's wrath covers everything and everybody 
that has rejected him, and it's poured out on them. And it's an eternity in the wrong direction. But the promise the believer has, so we got to have salvation. we got to know what it is. It's the promise of eternal life. And we're going to be with Christ and behind him when this happens. We're not going to be the subject of the sword coming out of his mouth. And lastly, we need to know, uh, we need to make sure that we know what he is and what he is coming back to earth to accomplish. So it's kind of like what everybody is looking for when you figure out, when you get born again and you know who Jesus is and you realize what the plan is, everybody wants to fast forward to this moment. Once you kind of get that revelation in your head and in your heart and you read it in the scriptures, once you figure out that Jesus is coming back, it's like, man, what does that look like? You know, we want to get there. He's coming back to earth to accomplish something, though. You know, it's like we want to go to heaven and we want to stay there. We don't, we don't really think about coming back here. But the Bible says there's a timing for things. And when, when the Antichrist is destroyed... The Bible says the devil is cast away and locked up somewhere for a thousand years. And that's, of course, part of why Jesus is able to rule in peace on the earth. Not everybody is going to be a believer on the earth at that time. You know, there's going to be a lot of people who survived the great tribulation, not a lot by today's standards. I mean, billions of people will die, but there will be a handful of people left. And for those thousand years, there's a plan and a purpose. And Jesus establishes himself as the ruler over his creation that he's originally formed. And he does it for a thousand years. Why did he do it for a thousand years? I have no idea. And I don't care. It doesn't matter. He could have said he was coming back for one day and done what he wanted to do. But he didn't say that. He said he's coming back for a thousand years. Okay. We've seen a thousand years before. We've got 6,000 years of documented human history right here. So it's not too much of a stretch to think that the earth could remain another thousand. And at the end of the thousand, the Bible speaks of the devil being led out of his prison. And what does he do? He does the same thing he does now. He goes out and he deceives. And he deceives on a national level. And he gathers an army against God's people again. And they get destroyed one final time. And then you get to go where you thought you were headed. Hopefully, it's to heaven. Hopefully, it's the promise, the new heaven, new earth. We read about this in the later chapters. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so let's get to the end here this morning. God had some promises in Ezekiel 37 that are interesting, um, but it seems like Israel likes to think that God is on their side while at the same time failing to be obedient to nearly everything he says. You know, Christians do the same thing. We like to say once we get saved, we just, we have this, this confidence in Christ and we're like, yeah, well, we got, and we start getting too arrogant and we say, well, God's on our side. Well, there's a lot of, I, I don't know a good word to use uh, from the pulpit, but there's a lot of Christians that are missing the mark there, okay? Because we get caught up in what we want to do and God's not in it. And we think because we're Christians, everything is just going to work out and God's always on our side. And that, that couldn't be further from the truth because God's on nobody's side. And if you want to be on his side, you got to submit to him. And that's really how his world works. In the nation of Israel, they, they dealt with it the same way. Isaiah 65, he said, I've stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, according to their own thoughts. A people who provoke me to anger continually to my face. Any, any school teachers in here? Do you ever have a student that does? Never mind. Let's not. My mom taught for 28 years, and it's like, I know the names and faces and social security numbers of every child. No, it's like they left an imprint, right? <clears throat> but God always saves a remnant. So maybe you came today and you're like, and maybe you've been in church for a long time, and you say, you know what, I get kind of tired of the church people, you know, because they, they're always messing up or whatever. Well, God always saves a remnant even in the worst of times. It's not for me to 
say that all Christians in every church in the world are doing right? Because I have no idea if they are. And in fact, I'll probably tell you that they're probably not doing right. They're probably not living right. They're probably not acting right. And their attitudes probably stink. And they're probably disobedient to lots of stuff in the Word of God. But God always saves a remnant. You know, I would like to think that all of our church is part of the remnant. I would like to think that, but I'll let God be the judge. But I know he's not going to just blast this place and every other church in town and level it just because maybe we're not always doing right. But he's going to save a remnant, and he's probably going to start with them to reach as many people as possible. You want to be a part of the remnant. You want to be that. You want to be connected to the remnant, right? You don't want to be out there chasing the world and what the world promises. So let's look really quick before we close at what happens to the world. And this is a multi-week. Today's is about peace. I, I felt impressed to bring a few lessons about the millennial reign of Christ on the earth to this church um, several weeks ago. And this first one is just about the peace that Jesus brings. In Isaiah 11, uh, we see some really descriptive things that happen here when Jesus is in charge and the world is submitting to him. And in Isaiah 11, there's a lot of things that happen. We're going to pick it up in verse 6. Now, get the visual on this. If you've ever been to Yellowstone Park or you ever been out in the woods, out in the wild, and you've seen nature um, at its best, you'll see that this doesn't happen. If you've ever been hunting or anything, you'll see that this doesn't happen. The wolf also, verse 6, shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Man, what a picture of life as we know it. When Jesus comes and brings peace to the earth, it, it puts everything right. You know, he puts an end to a lot of things. He puts an end to a lot of violence. In Isaiah 65, he says, It shall come to pass, before they call, I will answer, and while they're still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And I'll read you a couple of more here. Psalm 72 uh, in 3 through 8, he says, The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy, and break in pieces the oppressor. Uh, in verse 7, In his days shall the righteous flourish, and the abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. And then, in, I know I'm rattling off a lot here, but if you write them down, you can look them up. I think they're on, on the screen there. Micah chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, he says, uh, he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. See, he's changing the way that people think on the earth. He's establishing a new way of life that doesn't mean just kill everybody all the time when you don't like what they're doing. That, and it's funny because it doesn't just affect people. It affects the animals. I mean, it makes you wonder what life was really like and intended to be like when Jesus created it all. And you get back to Genesis, and you see that God brought all the animals to Adam, and he had them, him name them. And never one time did it say that a tiger attacked Adam, and he had to put it in a cage because it was bad. I mean, Joel's dog will be nice in the millennial reign. It won't bark at you. Think about that. You didn't bring him today, did you? Okay, I don't want to offend him. In Micah 3, it said, Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. It's just a new way of life, right? And you know what? It sounds really good. And the best part about it is, it's good because I know who's in charge. You know, this, this works for the whole world when Jesus comes back. And the gospel of salvation now works for the whole world. 
You know, it, this isn't just a special good news message. This isn't an American good news message. This works for everybody. And uh, we got to remind ourselves that when Jesus comes back, he isn't going to rule from Washington, D.C. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, we're actually one of those nations afar off, just so you know. So whatever that looks like, I don't know. But Jesus is going to rule from Jerusalem because that's what he said he would do. And he's going to come down and he's going to do that. So it has nothing to do with what we think. And I love our country and, and we have pretty much the best country in the world here. But we haven't been able to establish peace in the world that works for everybody. We haven't been able to do that. And we try our best, but we haven't been able to do it. We're not supposed to do it. We're not capable of doing it without God. We can do a lot of things and we can do a lot of good, but we cannot replace God. And there is a time when Jesus will establish himself. So when Jesus is in charge, violence is not a factor. I mean, I took the dog to the vet this last week, and they're trying to, you know, take his temperature. And that's not very comfortable. And they asked me the question, does, does your dog bite? And I said, well, I've never seen her bite, but I'm not going to guarantee anything in these circumstances. Violence is not a factor. Even the animals stop killing each other. The wolf and the lamb. I mean, Nash was telling me the other day about how he caught a bobcat a couple of years ago that was eating the chickens. It's like, yeah, that stuff isn't going to happen. They're going to eat grass. Well, that's pretty cool. People, you know, we didn't read all these verses, but it says that, that people won't die prematurely. Children aren't going to pass on before their time. The righteous will flourish during this time. The poor and the needy are not oppressed. I mean, that's, that's half of what goes on in the world today, is the poor and needy oppressed. When you look at the population dispersion across the globe, the massive amounts of humanity live in poor and oppressed areas on the earth. And it's generation after generation after generation, and there's no solution to it. But when Jesus comes on the scene, he brings a righteousness that affects all economic status, all classes of people, all races, all nations, everything. There's an abundance of peace. Philippians 4.9 says, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. See, this is part of God's character. He doesn't come and just like reinvent himself. If you read about who Jesus is from the beginning uh, that we know, and you follow his life, you see that all of these attributes of God are always there in him. It's just we like to take the ones that are our favorites, and we like to run with that. There's a lot of people in the New Testament times, a lot of the Jews, they were looking for a Messiah who would bring the wrath they wanted the Messiah to come and bring the sword and take care of their enemies. That's all they cared about. They didn't care about him bringing peace to the earth. They wanted somebody to dominate their enemies. There's a lot of Christians today that want the financial blessings. They want the promises of God, and they only want material blessings. Like, you know, the promises that if you tithe, that it will come back to you, you know, with an increase. There's a lot of Christians who just base their whole life on that but they forget about 99% of the other things that Christ has said. There's some believers who major on rights and wrongs, and that's all they can see. They have tunnel vision. And as long as they do, and they develop a doctrine of works, that as long as they do right, they're going to please God, and that that's all that matters in the world is just as long as I do this. And they forget about 99% of everything that Jesus said. He's always been a complete package, right? He's always been God. And... The attributes that we read about when he rules on the earth, when he returns, are all of those things. He's the righteous judge we're going to find out in the coming weeks. He's the God of peace at the same time. He institutes and pours out his wrath and judgment on wickedness at the same time that he is bringing everlasting peace to those who submit to him. It's really amazing. Nobody could do all of these things. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Colossians 3.15, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. And then finally, we get to the last verse of today. And this is really what we all need to consider. 
we know if we read the Bible and if we're born again, we know that Jesus is returning. Now, there is a, there is a time when the saints will be caught up with him. Is talking about the rapture, and that's a different message. But there's a time where the, the completion of events on the earth happens, and that is at this time, the millennial reign. You get one last thousand years on the earth, and then Jesus himself says, it has been enough, it's been a good ride, we're wiping the slate clean, and we're going to build a new one. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, this is what it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we head into this worship and prayer time in a few minutes, that's really what I want you to consider after hearing this message. Maybe you've never heard that Jesus is coming back for a thousand years, and that's kind of a cool little fact. Well, that's, that's good. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a purpose for him returning. And when we read this verse, let the God of peace sanctify you and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know why he says, I hope that happens to you? Because when Jesus returns, that's, that's it. It's like, where do you go from there? If you miss it when he comes back, you're not going to be on the right side. You know, the, the whole New Testament is trying to convince and exhort and teach and preach people into understanding that, hey, there's something you're missing, presenting them with the good news of the gospel, presenting them with sometimes knowledge, but it's got to go further than that. It's got to go further than knowledge. It has to come to this place where you submit your heart to God. And you can't submit your heart to an organization. You can't submit your heart to new life. But we love it that you come every week and that you're a part of everything and this is you and, and you and I are together. That's, that's all awesome and great, but that's not going to get you where you need to be on God's side. You got to submit your heart to the Lord. You got to repent and say, Lord, I don't want to go through this life and the next on my own power and my own merit. I need what you have and I need to get behind your message. And you know, that's how a person can be blameless in the sight of God. You're never going to be able to do it your way. Say, God, I tried my hardest to bring peace to the earth all of my days. I did my best, Lord. Is that going to be good enough? No, because you're not even in the right category of being good. But if you say, Lord, I had nothing to offer, but I saw what you did and I got behind you and I trust what you're doing. Oh, now we're having a different conversation because now God knows that you're on his side and you're not trying to invent a God that is on your side. You guys see the difference there? Let's be people who are behind what God's doing. And when we get to this next part of our service, let's be thankful about who he is in us now and who he is coming to represent on this earth. Amen? <music>